It's just thinking quickly, Emma, in another minute, maybe less. Do we see how many participants are on? Can you see? Yeah, I usually see it onto the chat. So here we go. So I want to just check this quickly. Yep, we're on. Just thinking quickly, Emma. In, in, there we go. Welcome, everyone. It is July, the new month of transformation. Um, a different theme for the open mic members. Thank you so much for joining, everyone. Um, I'm welcoming Emma K today. Thank you, Emma, all the way from Cape Town. Thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Looking so, sorry, Emma, carry on. Looking forward to it. Looking forward to yeah. exchanging ideas and getting questions as well. <laughs> so, yeah. So, people online, I mean, whoever's joining, thank you so much for joining. I would like to just extend thank you so much, everyone, you know, for supporting Open Mic over the last few months. It has been a trying time for everybody, you know, in the communities and the projects and the things that people are doing. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you to everyone. So um, to our American um, viewers, um, happy Independence Day for yesterday. To our Canadian viewers, um, and it was Canadian Day, I think, on the 2nd of July. So yes, I wish you both countries really well, and, and thank you very much for participating in Open Mic. So yes, Emma, let's get to it. So um, I want you to, I think, introduce yourself to everyone and, and welcome. Thanks. So before I start, I have a, I have a disclaimer is that I have a, a house full of rescue animals. I'm a bit of an animal uh, freak, I guess. So I have uh, three rescue dogs and three rescue cats. So I'm apologizing if you get a cat across the screen and lots of background noise from dogs. So uh, apologies for that. And they will uh, at some point um, express their voices. So I'm um, just giving you a heads up on that. So um, an introduction, I'm, I always struggle with that. Like, you know, what's my, what's my title? So um, I am a very English sounding Zimbabwean um, that's lived in Cape Town for nearly 30 years. So I guess I call myself Cape Tonian, uh, certainly South African. Um, even though my heart still sits in Zim. I am, and I'm a serial entrepreneur. So I guess that's the, the quickest way of, of introducing myself in terms of who I am um, in the, the way we like to define ourselves. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I mean, we have um, some viewers online. So thank you everyone for joining through um, and welcome. So Emma, let's, let's go through it. I mean, um, we talked about, you know, um, the things that you've been doing over the, you know, we've touched base on a few things that you've been doing. So I think let's get right to your story and you're going to see me writing. So please don't, don't worry. Um, it's just a few things that's coming through. So yeah, I'm going to give it over to you and, and let's take it from there. Okay, thanks. So um, where to start? I think, you know, the, un the theme of the month is transformation. I think that's really the narrative of my life. It's really been one of transformation. There's been no linear process. There's been no kind of grandmaster plan. You know, often people, you hear people say, you know, what is your two-year plan or what's your five-year plan or your 10-year plan? And I've always been kind of a bit floored by that. Like, oh, maybe there's something wrong with me because I don't have a plan. Um, it's just been really around um, feeling my way through things. I think the way I, I introduced myself to you is, the, is the, um, I have the ability of seeing the gap between the frames. So it's about being able to see opportunities and being able to follow those. So let's start with kind of my, my I, I guess, the, the story. So I am, as I said, I'm Zimbabwean and I wanted to be an actress of all things. And my mother was like, absolutely not. There's no, there's no, um, there's no money in that. Off you go, darling. So she kicked me out the house at 18 and I went to England to study at university. Um, which I did. And then I was uh, kind of put into the deep end of investment banking in London. Um, so I was working in investment banking, which I did well at, but it was, didn't really sit comfortably with, with my sense of who I was. And fortuitously, my mother again said, I need you to come home and bring a car home. And it was at the time in Zim when we couldn't buy cars. So the only way we could get a car back into Zimbabwe was as a returning resident. 
So it was like, okay, off I go, take back, fly back, arrive in Durban, collect the car and drive back to uh, Zimbabwe. I'm not very good at the small print and the small print basically said that as a returning resident, you have to live in the country for a year. So that meant there was no ways I was going to go back to England. So I was right doing, uh, writing short term, term money management programs for a discount house in Zim. And my very good friend said, you really are not having a good time. Um, and you really don't want to go back to England. So I didn't enjoy England. I, 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 as, as amazing as it was in terms of opening opportunities, it, it just is not my place to live. She said, you know what? there's this film coming to Zimbabwe. It's a film with a great big star. Uh, they are black people and they can't shoot the film in South Africa because of apartheid. So they're shooting it in Zim. So it's got Morgan Freeman and Danny Glover. Why don't you do it? And that was my first kind of window. Like there was no film crew in Zimbabwe. So I managed to get into the epicenter of, of the production. So I was basically doing a line a production management with this amazing cast of fantastic filmmakers. And that was, that was it. There was no point of return for me. It was like sex, drugs and rock and roll was a no ways I was going to go back to banking. So it was like, oh my God, my, I was young. It was exciting, it was dynamic. And the producer said, why don't you come to South Africa? I had, South Africa was not on my radar. So I followed his invitation and I came to South Africa. Again, I didn't read the small print is that you needed a work permit. So every two months or so I kept getting deported, um, but that didn't hold me back. I managed to kind of get the permits, do all the right things. And I ended up working on feature films, um, uh, really great, amazing feature films. It just opened my world into this kind of exciting place of stories of how stories are made and how um you know that they're the heartbeat of so many things but but also in terms of uh, working on big feature films each feature film is like doing a mini startup so i learned a lot about how you actually have to put all the moving pieces together to make a film mm -hmm. so i did that for quite a long time and then a colleague said to me you know why didn't you come and start an animation company and I was like, I know nothing about animation. You're kidding me. She's like, fine. You're smart. You can do it. So I again found the door opened, and I and I took the opportunity, and I walked through, and I set up my first uh, my first business, which was Triggerfish Animation. Um, it was and still is the largest animation company on the continent. We um, did all the, the. It was really at the beginning of, of uh, the animation industry, which was a very nascent industry at the time and Sesame Street came to Africa and there was no one animation company that could do it. So we pitched, wow. we bidded for it and managed to get the, the whole of the, set, the animation for Takabani Sesame Street. So I then basically put all the studios together. We created a blueprint in terms of how to execute large volumes of animation, 2D, 3D and stop motion. And we won um, awards all around the world and we started producing for the international Tuck, uh, Sesame Street uh, library and their US domestic library. And the reason was because we wanted to create an African brand. We didn't want to just uh, replicate Disney or um, Pixar in terms of style. We wanted to make sure that we were telling stories to our uh, preschoolers, early childhood development, ECD two to five, with things that were familiar to our, to our, to our kids around storytelling and what was familiar in terms of icons and images and um, cultural stuff. So it was a really interesting, really interesting first business to understanding how to put a business together, but also the fact that there is enormous power in storytelling and content. Um, after about 10 years, I became quite frustrated with the fact that uh, television was fairly limited in terms of the number of screens that were in people's homes. So I then felt that the new, and at the time, everyone thought I was crazy. So you can start to see there's a familiar theme here around kind of you know, taking the jump and being quite kind of, uh, uh, I'm not fearful of risk. And I felt that the next screen was gonna be the mobile phone and everyone said, you're crazy. And it was the mobile <laughs> phone. And now look where we sit. So it was, um, the second company was really around, let's take the mobile phone because it's gonna be in the hands of so many people in Africa and let's work, let's see how we can use that as a form of delivering content to people. So my second company, we became the top five globally for Nokia, developing all of their content and applications across all their series 1640 devices. 
And the reason we became the top five was not because I understood technology, because I didn't at the time. It was about understanding the value of storytelling. So I have a mantra, which is content drives the uptake of technology. It's not technology. There is so much pushed at yes. us around technology is the solution, but it's not. Yep. It's what, what sits on top of that technology that is meaningful to the user that makes it mm -hmm. relevant. So yep. we started doing really powerful stories. Uh, sorry, um, we looked at the early adopters who were skateboarders in Europe. So we created everything on the Nokia device for skateboarders, movies and films, applications for the applications, 160 page travel guide on the fly. So whether you're in Stockholm and London, you could see where to eat or sleep or, and that actually moved their devices, which they were struggling to sell. Then my third company was the intersection of technology and um, uh, entertainment, where I really started to look at the mobile phone industry, because at the time mobile phone was leapfrogging commute computers in Africa. And so it was a lot of push in terms of, of mobile technology. So it was mobile agriculture, mobile fintech, mobile health, mobile education very little was being looked at in terms of the creative industries which is a, a multi-trillion dollar industry and at the time the world bank put africa as only one percent of that multi-trillion dollar industry in terms of creative industries which just was blew my blew my mind of you know africa sits with this massive creative currency and why are we not unlocking it why are we not tapping into it in terms of music mm -hmm. and st stories and film and poetry so i raised a whole bunch of money out of silicon valley to create a platform which was enabling um, artists, filmmakers and musicians to self-publish. So we were targeting primarily um, musicians and filmmakers in South African context and townships who mm -hmm. don't have access to radio stations and record labels and film mm -hmm. deals. So you could self-publish to your audience. We worked in 22 different African countries mm -hmm. um, and we were working with film, uh, sorry, video, uh, poetry was very successful and, and then my the then basically that took me into understanding the culture and the nuances and the complications of township um, culture and how there's often a need from people and organizations to look from the outside into townships as opposed to the inside out and realizing that the systems within townships work and how do we how do we start to kind of look at systems and townships and where are the, some of the kind of the, the fundamental kind of areas that need to be addressed. And that put me into an area of looking at the conversations, particularly around the World Economic Forum, Internet for All, and then starting to look at national government narrative around smart cities. And there's a lot of conversation around smart cities of how we need to make our cities smart in Africa because it's a, it's a kind of a, it's a big conversation in the global north. Mm -hmm. And then I got to kind of interrogate that of, well, okay, that's, that's important, even in our last uh, State of the Nation uh, from our president was basically looking at our first smart city in, in land Syria. And so I started to really push against that by saying the bulk of our population, growing population, live in townships. So why are we not having a conversation around smart townships? And if we don't address smart townships, then mm -hmm. the bulk of our growing population are never going to be part of any digital economy or any fourth industrial revolution. So um, by the end of May last year, I'd actually achieved that and we created our first smart township in Cape Town, where we put a Wi-Fi mesh over um, Imazam Yetu. We rolled out digital skills and literacy and we launched the first hyperlocal TV station. And I use TV in inverted commas because it's not a TV as we understand it using spectrum. It's just because people understand TV. So it was uh, training citizen journalists to shoot content uh, using their mobile devices around their community, daily content, whether it be social justice issues or uh, cooking shows or music videos. And it, we, we built a platform that sat on the back of our Wi-Fi network, which made it zero rated. So mm -hmm. anyone in that community could go and engage with all of their local content and it was a really interesting and powerful way to, as a puncture point into populating the portal with educational content. So we included a lot of um, metric information. I included a lot of animation for ECDs because a lot of the, the mums at spaza shops are in their spaza shops. Uh, they've now got their um, connected device, but the kids mm -hmm. are not, not going to any ECD um, 
in the area so they could have a so, divided much education. So how was that uptake on the townships, right? Because were they welcoming with the project and what it was enabling it? I mean, how did you, how did you, I wouldn't say convince, but how did you approach the township in accepting something like this, right? Because, you mm. know, townships, obviously they have their own challenges in terms of obviously, um, let's talk about the water system and they have a whole lot of challenges inside the townships, right? Now mm. you're bringing connectivity to the outside world to them and you're giving them something that obviously they would need it to have embraced. What was the uptake of, of what you were trying to do with them? That's a really, really good and important question. So I'll just give you a little bit of context. Um, so in terms of the, the rollout of Wi-Fi into townships, it's incredibly limited. Um, and yeah. that one, so in terms of the uh, provincial government, uh, there's very limited uh, internet access in townships. Uh, if you look at the city of Cape Town, there's also very limited access to the townships. There are pockets of private companies rolling out Wi-Fi, but what mm -hmm. they tend to do is to have their, their vans with their engineers and rolling out uh, Wi-Fi. So there's a lot of vandalism and theft. What we did, which is to answer your question, is that we worked only within the community. So what that looked like was that the, um, the installers came from the community, the voucher sellers came from the community, every, every, wow. every point there was community participation. So we okay. had zero uh, vandalism or theft. Just to give you a sense of numbers, the Western Cape at the time had 178 mm -hmm. uh, uh, free Wi-Fi spots across the Western Cape. In a small okay. community of 14 hectares of Imazamiyatu, we had over 120 access points. So whether you were in a shack or a spaza shop or a concrete structure, yeah. you could have your own access points, which meant that I then had connectivity and I could okay. then offer vouchers to my community. So just as a comparison to give you a sense of how successful it was in the one year of um, giving a mesh, uh, sorry, an ac access to the community, we retained 17 and a half million rand in that tiny community of 35,000 people in comparison to what they were spending on mobile uh, data. So the wow. uptake was significant. Um, yeah, that uptake was incredible, man. I mean, we were moving, to, we were moving terabytes through, through our pipes in terms of data. And then wow. the important part is to make sure that you roll out digital skills and literacy. So we yes. worked very closely with the community, specifically women, uh, because they were often the, the SMEs in the community of really mm -hmm. understanding what it means to be connected. So there's often an assumption because you've got a mobile phone, you, it, often you don't understand what that means in terms of being connected. Yes. Uh, in fact, even understanding you are connected to the internet. And that was why it was so important to roll out um, hyper-local content because it was about uh, in my language, for me, by me, made by my community. So at every point with community involvement, which was why okay. the, the TV station, TV in quote commas was so important because it was again, community members telling my stories yeah so it was the, yeah so you can actually say it was the community's project that thought about it rolled out it you know kind of um, embraced and sold what they thought could help them you know in the long run that was a very good way to embrace a, a project like this um, yeah totally and and it's scalable so again it's about you yes. know how you enable uh, businesses to scale especially if you're looking at social impact and a footprint of social impact, which is what I was doing, is really how, how do you bring the growing population into the digital economy? Because again, we hear it over and over again, but I'm gonna say it, COVID is a very stark reminder of the, the, of the massive inequalities that we experience. And did, at the heart of it is digital. So yes. with, with COVID, we all moved to online. So it meant that I had to have a Zoom connection or a, t a Microsoft team or a Google uh, uh, classroom to be even connected if I'm a student or a, a business person. So if you just take the statistics that we just, the vast majority of our population do not have internet access, that put a massive wedge into the equality equation. So wow. it's, it's imperative that that smart yes. city conversation is addressed going forward if we're yeah. gonna be looking at any meaningful integration. Um, you know, so I'm working with a company at the moment, again, just to kind of give you an example of, of, it's not just about being connected because I'm going to be on a Zoom call or I need to be connected because I'm being on Facebook. So mm -hmm. even if we look at the, the um, distribution of food hampers, 
70% of the money of, uh, for, for the distribution goes into logistics, 30% goes into the hampers. So I'm working with the company at the moment of, let's look at the, the infrastructure within townships, which are our spaza shops. The spaza shops have got stock. So why not work with the spaza shop owners? At the end of every day, they say, this is what capacity we have to fill a hamper. It means they need to be connected and, and being able to operate uh, an app. So they can basically just immediately upload. We can supply 10 hampers today, which means mm -hmm. that 10 people in the community can go to that spaza shop, get their hamper with no transport issues, um, supporting local businesses, which means there's liquidity back into the township. And 70% uh, goes into the hamper and 30% into logistics, but I need to be connected. So we need to be looking at the kind of issue of connectivity, which has a massive impact across everything. So that was the that was the last thing, and then and then COVID happened, and again transformation being kind of the narrative um, of my life is, you know, shut down, lockdown, and it was, gosh, you know, of course, the systems are changing, which is kind of nothing new for me. It's like I don't believe the systems that we've operated have necessarily been functional or necessarily um, impactful and systems are needing to change going forward. And so in that quiet time, I observed that people were spending money on food, clearly, and their babies, children, and pets. Mm -hmm. So it was like, gosh, that's so interesting. Let's look at the pet industry. So I started to investigate the pet industry and realized that the pet industry is a massive, massive trillion dollar industry globally, but it also mm -hmm. contributes to a massive environmental disaster in terms of uh, the food, it's part of the mass uh, you know, farming issue around mass farming of meat, mass farming of vegetables, hormones, antibiotics, pesticides, et cetera, et cetera. And I suddenly thought there has to be a different way. There has to be a different way of creating an ethical dog brand or brand for pets. And so that's my latest venture as I've now launched a new a company called Happy Hounds, which is really around the provision of ethical food for, for dogs, and it will branch out into other products. But for now, the, the, the dog food is entirely pasture-fed, using pasture-fed meat, uh, organic farm, uh, organic veggies and herbs from the micro farmers in Cape Town, uh, mm -hmm. mega oils, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the thing is, it's not just about provision of extraordinary food for our dogs, but it's part of a building an ecosystem because it was looking at the, the micro farmers that were struggling to sell their veggies during COVID. So we, we buy from all the micro farmers in Philippine Kailicha. Um, so it's building out again, the ecosystem of working within how we can make communities um, uh, not necessarily abundant. I like the word of sufficiency. We need to be look, working more towards living sufficiently in a place of sufficiency rather than abundance because it kind of abundance leads to excess surplus. So we're looking at building out communities. So we're gonna be working with artists as well, local artists to create beautiful like water bowls and dog blankets. And so it's building out a community around an ethical brand of, of um, for our pets. So that's kind of my, my kind of my, I guess that the, the non-linear way of my life and how it's evolved. And I think the, 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 the one thing I'd like to say about the way I've, I've kind of looked back retrospectively, as I said, there was no master plan, but it was around living with courage in terms of if a door opens, walk through it. So often we don't do it. And um, if you just kind of look at the, the, the storyline I've told you, and it's never been conscious at the time. I, I kind of, you know, obviously it's so much easier to be looking back and now I'm in my fifties, it's kind of, <laughs> that would, you might, not meant to laugh quite so hard with so much passion when I say fifties, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so now I can look back and go, gosh, you know, when, and when a door, when an opportunity comes, I do walk through. And I think that's the, that's the message of transformation that really, sits in my heart of you know do it with absolute fullness of heart and walk through and um there's a wonderful um quote from teddy roosevelt if you give me two seconds i would like to read it because I, I don't want to kind of misquote it sure um, uh, and it's basically 
Okay, it's the end bit that's really punchy, but I'm gonna read you the whole bit. Um, okay. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out, so forget the gender bias. Remember, Teddy Roosevelt was in a different kind of era, but it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there's no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds? Who knows great enthusiasm, great devotion, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails daringly, greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. So I'm going to say that last bit again because it's in, it's that's the part that I always kind of think about. If he fails, at least fails with daring great. Sorry. If he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who never know neither victory nor defeat. So that's kind of where I'd like to leave my story and open it up to you asking questions. Um, anyone else who's on the on the live Facebook stream to ask questions? I'm, I really like interaction and rather than yeah. solo voice. <laughs> <laughs> so guys, I mean, please, I mean, Emma's welcoming anyone to, to send some questions, your thoughts, any questions that you may have in terms of how do you walk through that door? So, so Emma, you know, they always say, you know, walking, walking through a door um, and having the courage to walk through the door and, and, and to your point, have a full heart when you walk into the door. That resonates, you know, um, not everybody is at that point. It's not you know, it's not likely that people want to walk through that door, knowing that it's the right door. I think it's having that courage to walk through that door. You know, how do, what would, what would you, what would you give some of the advice to the viewers that, you know, if the door opens, walk through it, you know, what are some of the things? So you, you to me, you sound like a very free spirited person, right? Um, you've mentioned that you're not, you're not very risk averse. So you just go with it, right? <laughs> I do, and I'm not sure that's necessarily the right advice that I would like to leave people, because I mean, we're all obviously built so very differently, obviously. Yes. Um, but for me, it's, it's, it's quite, it's, within the business context, it's quite difficult to answer that question because what my, quest, my response is often quite fluffy. Um, mm -hmm. Is it like, you know, this, this is the response from a change management theory perspective or, you know, th those kinds of typical answers. For me, it's, it comes down to, it's got to feel right. And, mm. and I think that in, in our society and particularly in technology, which is kind of underpins everything I do, is that we've, we've forgotten how to listen. The, the technology that we are kind of so consumed by has created an enormous amount of noise, an enormous amount of clatter. Um, mm -hmm. And, and the, it doesn't help that the algorithms that are being put into these systems are built in such a way to keep our attention focused and busy on that technology as opposed to being able to listen carefully to what it is that we want to do um, and and so it it is a fluffy answer but it's a very powerful answer because if you can stop and listen it it feels right when it does feel right and when you, when it feels right then it's it makes it easier to take that first step and then the affirmations then start coming and then it's you, then you take the next step you take the next step and the other thing is not to be afraid to ask for help it took me a while mm. to learn uh, i really it took me a, it was like oh i can do it all on my own and, you know you know <laughs> it's like no one can do it better than me and i it's just like actually that was kind of realizing when when i was building teams is that it's it's about getting people who are better than you and asking asking for help and even when you're you opening that door and you're walking through, you'll get lots of naysayers. Um, so asking for help is important to get the naysayers as well as those who are going to support you because it's about having different mm -hmm. perspectives. Um, mm -hmm. So you're not going in with just rosy tinted glasses and like this is going to be perfect. Because I think this, it's a, there's a, there's a, uh, a healthy um, element of, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, to be 
observant of the pitfalls and and but not to allow yourself to fall through them just to it's there there are challenges and not to be kind of uh, self-delusional that it's all going to be rosy and be up Absolutely. to challenge you know i think it's Absolutely. That's part of the courage is knowing that it's going to be tricky sometimes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, it's true. Absolutely. I, I agree with you. We have a lot of, we have a lot of entrepreneurs um, that's on the call that have their own business. Welcome, Karen. Welcome, Jackie. Hi, Amina. Um, hi, Kimmy. Kimmy just joined right now. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And we also have Rob that's on the call as well. Thank you very much, ladies, for, for all joining. Please send through your comments and questions and thoughts that you may have um for for emma so emma what has been i mean you've been in various different industries i mean the type of projects that you've been across the globe and, and the things from animation to production to um doing a smart township through now you in happy hounds right now doing producing i think what has been your biggest your biggest lessons that you've learned moving through all the different phases of your life because you've clearly have learned so much and you know, as you move to the different industries and the different, you know, the ways that you have been working, you have clearly learned so much, right? And obviously you take that with you every time that you move forward as well, right? So what are some of your, your biggest lessons you've learned? Um, so the kind of the, I think the, 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 on the kind of, I'm not, not saying negative or positive, one of the things I've learned and understood is the power of curiosity and, and how mm. valuable that is. You know, it's just about okay. to maintain curiosity. Um, and um, I do have uh, strongly held opinions or loosely held opinions, whatever how that phrase goes, around education and that it doesn't promote curiosity. And so it's about making sure that we um, cultivate as much curiosity in our friends and our and our children as, as we can because it's 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 a thing that I think is the is the is the thing that can lead us forward as opposed to kind of uh, success driving us forward so curiosity has been is a really strong element for me in terms of the challenges that I've, I've experienced um I think to be honest one of my the, the from building businesses um the biggest challenge has been around human capital and it's really around um making sure so one of the one of the first mistakes i ever made was not mm -hmm. and this sounds quite harsh is not getting rid of the bad apples in the cart quick enough um it's, it's that thing of like it's always going to get better it's always going to get better no. and no. it never gets better no. so <laughs> it gets worse it gets worse <laughs> It gets so, worse. Yeah, it does. It's about, it's about being really clear with boundaries. And as mm -hmm. soon as you see that the the kind of the people in the team are not gelling, working, uh, it's you, it's got to change. It's the biggest, the first thing to do. So I, one of my first mistakes was not getting rid of people quick enough. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And and that then had a massive knock on to a whole bunch of things. So um, that was my very big learning um mm -hmm. the second is just about observing uh the nuances around uh culture how you develop culture um because mm -hmm. your culture within your company becomes becomes the brand yeah uh, we, we think we we forget that that is actually half of it we think that the product is the brand but it's mm -hmm. the culture you build and how you build that which comes back to the human capital it's like who's in your team how do you build that and how do you Cultivated. So very, it's so very yeah. interesting you saying this, right? It's very true. People don't buy your product or service. People buy what you stand for. People totally. buy what you believe in. People buy your culture. They don't look. They have no doubt you are good at what you do, right? It's about what do you stand for? What what do you what do you you know? Products and services is physical. It's tangible. It's something that you can see. It's something you can feel. It's something that you can deliver. Yeah, but it's who you are. They actually resonate more with who you are than anything else. And culture is a huge thing in any organization. Enormous, and I mean, particularly if you're and for those who are entrepreneurs on on the on the feed, well, and I would I'd love to learn from them too because we all have stuff to share. I mean, being an entrepreneur 
is often a lonely place and it's about being able to learn from each other and 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 work collaboratively and, and share stories and share learnings because that's really important as we all grow in these in our fast changing industries um and the 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 thing about being an entrepreneur particularly just as you're starting out is that you do think you're alone but actually you're not it's just again it comes back to reaching out for help and and that cultural thing is so incredibly important and it's become even more so important particularly as we're moving into uh kind of the the different generations around authenticity and around mm -hmm. integrity and about communication and how valuable that is it's, it's the it's the ability to communicate your core values and those core values have got to be truly authentic otherwise that your your customers see through it immediately immediately mm. um so it's and i'm i know i'm preaching to convert that point to the converted on the on the on the feed that's <laughs> so yeah Me any too. other questions from, from our entrepreneurs so any questions, guys, send me your thoughts, send me your questions. I'm not too sure. So they're kind of quiet today. I think, Emma, you you stunned them a little bit today. Uh, I'm just going to send, send your questions to... Oh, let go of my pack. Sorry, guys. <laughs> no, don't worry about it. Um, so, Emma, how how is Happy Homes going? I mean, that must be a, quite a interesting um business to get into happy hounds i mean it's it's not something that um you were doing i mean what made you what made you go you know into that my COVID, my COVID hustle <laughs> <laughs> your COVID hustle <laughs> hustle um so i mean it's a it really simple story i it was during lockdown and um as i alluded to I'm incredibly passionate about my my animals and I walk the mountain every day and I foster and I was kind of what I mean I don't know why it didn't occur to me before but I was watching them and you know putting these pellets down every day and I was struck by the fact that every single day I put down pellets which I spent a fortune on I always have to add something to their pellets to make them eat them so then I yes. started to unpack that of like hang on a minute, so who, at what point did this, you know, I think it was in the 70s, this whole kind of convenience movement happened, that Tupperware was convenient and plastic was convenient and fast food was convenient and our world was taken over by convenience. And the mm. pet industry, I'm sure, was part of that. I haven't done the research. So suddenly pellets are convenient, right? It's a very convenient part of our living. We just go and we buy yes. a big thing of pellets and we bring it back. And um, then I started to think about what went into those pellets and how it was perpetuating uh, a massive industry which doesn't sit comfortably with me so I like I like to live my world the way I describe it I like to tread gently in my world so even in Cape Town I have a, a little urban oasis in the middle of the city so I only have indigenous plants I've got a beehive I have veggie garden that I live off I've converted my pool to an eco pool that I swim in that I grow edibles like celery and mint and so I like to tread gently in my world. It was like, so if I'm doing that in my world, why am I not doing that for my pets? Because um, I'm now kind of part of this large industry and I'm over trying to encourage them to eat their pellets. So I started to make my own. Okay. Um, and it was really observing the fact that, so I, I've been also part of these, you know, these food boxes that are going around of please support yes. because the micro farmers are struggling. And, and, and so it was like, okay, so, if they're struggling, how can I support them too? Not just about buying my food box, but okay. how we support these micro farmers with these organic veggies and herbs and give our dogs great food. So I started to get pasture fed meat, organic veggies and herbs and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And I started to feed my, and then a couple of friends were like, mm, can I please try? So <laughs> they tried and then it got bigger and then it got bigger. And then now that became regular. And now it's like, oh my gosh, this is an opportunity I had not seen, but I was staring me in the face. Is that, as I said earlier, the pet industry is a massive, massive sector that's worth okay. a large amount of money. And there are not many ethical dog brands in terms, certainly in South Africa. So ethical, I mean, not just the food, but 
water bowls, uh, the, the treats that they eat that are not full of ammonia and mm. the, the fillers and the slime that goes into them. So it was about extending my, my ethos of treading gently in my world to my animals. Mm -hmm. Okay. People of animals, and um, so there are three main things. It's an industry, so it's a, it's a revenue generating industry. It's about making sure that as many dogs eat good food, and thirdly, mm -hmm. not perpetuating a cycle of mass farming, whether it be meat or vegetables, which are full of hormones, antibiotics, pesticides, and herbicides. So it's okay. about uh, building a community around that. So yeah, it's you going basically to created that eco, you created that eco cycle, right? That's what you did. It's exactly that. Yeah, yeah which that's is, what you did. Which is the theme for all of the businesses I do. It's about building yeah. communities yeah. and ecosystems around, yeah. whether it be around technology or entertainment or a combination of the above. Um, mm -hmm. But again, it's about finding the opportunity in a new sector, being curious, learning, and then mm -hmm. growing with it. And so now, yeah, it's, it's quite extraordinary how it's just accelerating. Um, so yes, okay. that's the answer to so we, so we have two questions and they're both from Kimmy. So I'm gonna go through the first one first and then answer that and then we're gonna go through the second one, okay? So the first one is, what was it in your life or childhood that makes you who you are in business today? Thanks, Kimmy. <laughs> that is so deep. <laughs> oh, trust Kimi to go that way. <laughs> um, you know, I think growing up in Zim um, was a really interesting time. Um, I grew up during uh, what was our civil war. Um, so I would, for example, we, we would uh, we would we would go places, and I my sister and I would have to lie on the, on the floor of the car because often cars were shot at. So we would have to kind of lie on the floor of the car. Underneath my bed was a, a, a manhole down to the basement, down to the basement full of AK-47s. It was, it was a very strange childhood of dealing with a lot of change. And I was part of a family of serious activists. Um, uh, so we were constantly kind of being watched and, and kind of observed. Um, and inequality was at the main, the main heartbeat of the family home of the deep inequality that was that we were living in in Zimbabwe, particularly around around race at the time. So um, I was brought up to be always questioning, always observing, always curious. Um, my mother was a very very dominant uh, uh, woman who kind of was an editor of a political magazine and always kind of again at the edge of stuff. So we were always challenged to be something different. Um, mm -hmm. And then it, being in Zim, you are, it's an inbred thing of like hustle. You make a plan. And mm -hmm. I think everyone's an, an inbred, kind of a, a, a inherently an entrepreneur because you, you've, you've got to make a plan. Um, yeah. It's always about looking for the opportunity and finding a solution. It's, it's not yes. about that, oh my God, I, I need to read a book to learn about it. You have to learn on the fly. <laughs> yeah. You know? um, I don't think to my, I, I genuinely don't think I have ever read a business book, for example. It's not about the manuals. It's about kind of learning and making mistakes. Yeah, totally agree. Totally can resonate with you as well, uh, Emma. And the second half of the question is, is there a specific memory in time that you look back and go, when I was young, I wanted to do this, or oh, wow, look at, wow, look, this is what I am doing, Kimmy. Another deep one. Um, the, 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 it's got nothing to do with what I've ever done. The, the thing I knew, it's a very, such a good question. If I look back, the thing I know I, that made me the very happiest was I wanted to be a gardener. That was what I a really gardener. wanted. I wanted to work and be in the garden with my hands in the soil. Um, that's what I knew I, that made me the happiest. It was the most peaceful place. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I look back, I go, wow, you created all of that with no real kind of focus on like, I'm going to be the serial entrepreneur. 
but I do the but but having said that um, I was constantly making and doing stuff so whether it was uh, hustling stealing my fam my mother's fruit and hustling at the end of the road and selling it and you know making stuff and trying to sell it and always hustling but the thing that I wanted to be was a gardener so the wow moment is like wow you achieved all of that and your dream was to be a gardener yeah Kimmy I hope that answers your questions but great questions thank you so much um, Amina has a question for you um, Emma do you add supplements to your dog food and uh, no, I don't. Um, I am starting to look at things like turmeric um, for the hip joint. So I've done an enormous amount of research. The reason I don't add supplements is because I'm using a very balanced uh, uh, menu, yes, that's the way to call it, of different kinds of meat um, uh, and veggies and herbs, the omega oils and the eggs. So, and because there are no pesticides or herbicides or hormones, it is very balanced, nothing's taken out of it. If I'm going to add anything in it, it's gonna be things like glucosamine and turmeric for the dogs with, with um, hip problems. Um, but mm -hmm. I am going to look at more, you know, what, what should I be addressing in terms of uh, ailments? The interesting thing, just to quickly, in terms of the supplements, the, uh, I've got um, a group of dogs with kind of itchy skin problems. And mm. um, so there the, are the three main buckets. Uh, the healthy dogs, the ones with the itchy skin problems, the fussy eaters, um, and the ones that don't eat. And the ones which have got, all of them are coming back. The itchy skin dogs are coming back with less and less itches. The fussy eaters are hoovering up their food and no longer fussy. Mm -hmm. um, the um, the non-eaters are starting to eat. And the underlying overall unintended outcome of all of this is a change in behavior. It's been the most bizarre thing. I just made a delivery um, or a lady came to collect just before this and she said, you told me about this, but I didn't quite believe you, but my dogs are more playful. They're genuinely <laughs> happier, they're more playful. So I guess it makes sense, right? If you, if we, we observe what we put into our body, it mm. affects our mood, so it's gonna affect our dogs. So. so Amina says, turmeric may not be good for dogs. She said, omega oils and eggs may be great. Good value, that's valuable, thanks, I'll look into it. So um, I'm Omega Oils and Eggs are, um, so I'm working closely with three vets um, and we're working towards getting vet approval next week. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm not kind of doing this on the fly. So mm -hmm. it's really working closely with, you know, what should we be putting into a balanced meal? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I'll look into turmeric, so thank you for that. Yeah, she said Omega Oils and Eggs, that's interesting, maybe great, so I think it also depends. Uh, she says maybe maybe a calcium so I, i've got uh, i put um eggs in and i use the shells so they're pasture fed and hen eggs so again there's no rubbish in them so the whole okay. egg goes in, um and that it gets uh highly blended into so all of the shells and everything go in so we're getting calcium okay. into that we're getting a lot of calcium from the broccoli spinach they get butternut sweet potato <laughs> They get more uh, intake than I do. I just want to say that, okay? We do, no, no, it's a very balanced, very balanced. But the herbs are thyme, basil, parsley. So it's, uh, it's coconut oil, yeah. olive oil. Okay, I, I'm, I'm being serious. They're probably getting more intake than I do. I can tell you that now, Emma, right? <laughs> Off the bat. Off the bat, right? So I need to try our product for three hounds at different products at different times. Okay. Kimmy's just saying she's gonna try three, she's gonna try um, your product um, on her hounds. Um, Kimmy, give it a try. Uh, pick your knees and mix. Hey. I said thanks, Kimmy. Yeah, she says it's pick your knees and mix breeds. That's that's you know, that's the dog's good thing she has. So obviously she's gonna try it and see. So what's your plans for happy hounds? I mean, obviously you're based in Cape Town. Um, and um, I'm I'm assuming, and I could be wrong, that you're only supplying in uh, in Cape Town. Do you have expansion plans to move some of these products over? I mean, I'm in Kautang. so Kautang, KwaZulu Natal. Steady yeah. on, steady on, baby steps, <laughs> baby steps. 
you know yeah i mean don't scale too quickly it's another entrepreneurial kind of lesson don't scale yeah. too quickly iterate yep. no nope. mistakes do your thing get your product mm -hmm. right get your audience right i mean don't forget this is a, this is a new sector for me i'm you know i'm in technology yes. and entertainment you know working mm -hmm. on a global arena so um this as i said you know stumbled on it into it mm -hmm. because of covid so yeah. i'm learning and again it's about curiosity leading me and i i want to iterate carefully because mm -hmm. it's you know it's about people's pets which are really important to me and them yeah so i am treading very very carefully in terms of no, learning absolutely understanding mm -hmm. But I, and I want to, I'm, my intention is to build an online store, which I'll be mm -hmm. starting with uh, hopefully in the next two weeks with the flagship product being the food, but introducing, mm -hmm. as I said, um, other products which support our local artists. So, you know, beautiful ceramic water bowls and beautiful uh, uh, dog blankets and beds that are made mm -hmm. by, so I want to work with the, um, also the, the micro artists. <laughs> Um, who, so in other words, not just working with big chains, because we've got that and there's a market for that. But I'm, I want to work with um, the artists, the artisans who make mm. the locals. Products. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Locals working with beautiful products. So it's, it's a holistic yeah. site around, as I say, the flagship product being the dog food. Um, mm -hmm. But again, it's about building out that community, which you can see is what I love doing. Um, okay. So yes, we'll see where it goes. We'll see where mm. it goes. In the meantime, I still do my advising on social impact around technology, um, and mm -hmm. so that that's that's what I do now. So, mm -hmm. as I said, Happy Hounds is my side hustle, but now it's becoming very much more than a side hustle. It's becoming a bigger hustle, and I really love it. I mean, like I'm quite taken by the fact that it's extraordinary to witness people's responses so palpably. It's just like it's oh my God. The it's the gardener in you that's coming out. That's yeah. what's happening. It's the gardener, in, and I and I think that's why it's it's resonating more with you. It's the gardener in you, and I think that's why Kimmy asked that question, right? It's the gardener in you that's coming out that's making you want to create and give off. And obviously, it's a type of production you have to do in terms of the of the food, right? But it's the whole researching. It's getting into the production. It's looking at you know, the soil and, you know, all of those type of things. And, and it's the garden in you coming out, right? Because that's what you wanted. Yeah. Love it. I really love it. But, <laughs> you know, I also really do love, which I think you asked me when we chatted the other day around, you know, the, the thing that really underpins everything I've done is social impact. So the, the, the thing I, you know, I, I love about the advising stuff is it's around being able to advise on um, organizations that deploy funds into Africa where we can actually look at how that social impact can be improved um, and mm. footprint made bigger. So I think it's both and. I think it's, a, it's, mm. it's lovely to be able to have the knowledge and the skill set to look at those kinds of bigger conversations that technology mm. seems to be kind of in every conversation. And then something really much more local and um, um, how do, it's, it, it's, it's tangible. Mm. Yeah. Tangible, you know, yeah. Like, so, so Emma, we, we, we talked very briefly about social impact and sustainable, you know, if you look at COVID and what we're trying to look at from a, from a sustainable perspective and what it has halted, you know, the, the, the world, you know, to look at the social environments and stuff. So obviously, as much as you're saying, you know, Happy Hounds is a side hustle. I think you also look at that whole ecosystem and, and how um, sustaining the environment, you know, I have a few more entrepreneurs coming on this month and I think, and, and I mentioned this to you, we're going to have a kitchen talk about social impact and, you know, the sustainable, you know, environments and, you know, how we helping. And I think we're going to bring you to the kitchen, you know, this month in, in July, and we're going to see what we're going to talk about and, and bringing more entrepreneurs, you know, to the table with you. And I think, when we have a lot of people around the table talking about the same impact, I think it's about how do we get together and create this massive change that we know that we can do, whether it's just in South Africa, whether it's just in a small community, I think the word of mouth is quite crucial right now. And I think we do need to tap into this. We need to make that social change, make that mindset shift into what are we actually doing to the environment right now? Yeah. I mean, I think that's, a, I mean, to yes, absolutely. I mean, my response to that is that there's, uh, I think there, there are three things I can pull out of that. One is 
yes, what is the environmental impact that we that we have, and how do we take uh, personal responsibility in the lives that we lead that kind of you know impacts that on a, on a global level. But the thing that COVID I think has highlighted amongst many things is this interesting interplay between globalization and localization. Yeah. Um, which again feeds into into environment and social impact. So yes, technology has enabled the global conversation to happen. So you know, if, even to even to your event open mic is that it was a physical yes. event. So at two o'clock yes. uh, the physical event. Now if you're in the States, you can tune into this conversation. So it's yes. it's opened up the borders um, if you have access to technology. So you yes. know that 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 again feeds into the conversation I had earlier around the wedge that is being pushed into inequality through lack of access. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so globalization is, is here to stay, but underlying that is a very, very strong focus on local. How do we support our locals? Yep. And I'm sure yep. it's the same in Pretoria, but it's certainly in Cape Town, the local industries have mushroomed, You know, whether it be around bone broth production or bread making or jams or... So a lot of people are now finding other things mm. to do and there is more and more support of that and I don't see that going 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 away I think it's yep. going to be more and more of a support because it feeds into the sustainable um, conversation it, it is more sustainable it is more yes. kind of keeps our footprint smaller yeah but I also think that it needs to be heard though people need well, to hear more about this People need to talk more about this. I mean, in entrepreneurs as well, if I have a look today as well, it's, it's you know, it's, it's definitely shifting the mindset of certain people and how they view certain things, right? Um, and I don't think the conversations are held at the right places. And hence why I'm saying, Emma, I think we need to shout more louder, if that's the correct word in saying that, <laughs> from a local perspective. Yeah, yeah um, um, I think that those conversations, um, my my experience is that those conversations are happening. Those conversations are happening on you know at, on at a at a local level. The ripple the ripple effect is happening. So more and more people are talking about local. More and more people are supporting local. So it's yeah. it's starting to have um, you know it's it's that kind of like dropping a piece of mercury without no containment. It starts it starts to grow. It's spreading. Yes. Um, and I I think it's about lots of collective voices talking at once. And yeah. having more, more success stories coming out that build that kind of critical mass that can mm. move the needle. Um, yeah, I, I do believe fundamentally that it's local and global, um, but mm -hmm. underpinning is a, is a sustainable issue, sustainability okay. issue. Hundred percent. So, Amina says, I sincerely wish you the best on your dog food journey. This is much needed in the industry. <laughs> I Thanks. think you under you underestimated the side hustle that you have, Emma. I think I might have. Uh, yeah, I think I might have. So yeah, good things come out of lockdown. It comes back to the thing I said earlier: is that we just need to listen. Yeah. No, absolutely, That's Emma. Sad. There's no more questions. There's no more feeds from anyone, guys. Thank you so much, Emma. I just want to say thank you so much. You know, it's been great having you on. Um, it's it's enlightening to to see how you've moved through the different industries and how you've grown and and the things that you've you've done. You know, it's it's amazing to find women like yourself um, and and many you know many women out there that has achieved so much you know in their careers in their journeys. Um, what I like is you know how you position this whole thing. You know, um, you know from where you started to where you are right now. It's a phenomenal story. So. Thank you so much, you know, from my, from my side, from Open Mic. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing. Um, okay, so Kimi wants to say something. I love the network of people I meet when I support local and forward the context um, to have onto others. Um, small eventually is large. There is huge market for organic pet food in Cape Town, but I am sure if there was a network link in other major cities, it would spread very quickly. Yep, she's true. Hence why I said to you, uh, that side hustle, I can tell you now, it's not a side hustle. Not at yeah. all. Not at all. <laughs> not at all, Emma. Yeah, I agree. Thank yeah. you, Kim, for the questions. Uh, thank you to your um, Amina. members. To, yeah, yeah, and Amina, thank you. You're very valuable about turmeric. Thank you. And I am... Um, really really value everyone's time thank you for being on on the 
Facebook feed, Zoom, whatever we're going to call it. And thank you for setting us up for enabling more and more people to tell their stories. And, and I'm going to go back onto Facebook. I would love to engage with people and hear their stories. Um, yeah. It's about an exchange of stories. So yeah. thank you for everyone's time. I know it's precious mm. and thank you for making it happen. You know, absolutely. You know, Emma, one of the things, you know, you touched on earlier on your talk about, you know, sharing stories, you know, sharing stories is very important. You know, how we look at it, how we challenge it, how do we face it? How do we overcome it? And I believe that, you know, when we start continuously sharing everyone's stories and everyone's journeys, no matter what it is, whether it's business, whether it's personal, doesn't matter the type of story that it is, it does open up to more inspiration and to how ourselves that we can face those challenges and and learn you know you know from others as well um oh kimmy i i will share it um please share the youtube link um and post it well to the fans who are not on facebook okay so guys um all the videos all the interviews are on youtube um open mic foundation has a youtube channel um i will send out that that link onto our facebook group um am i usually download um this onto the facebook um uh, onto the link yeah. yeah, and then I usually put it onto onto the YouTube channel as well. Um, and then, yeah, I think a lot of people are getting off Facebook. So we're trying to balance between um, YouTube channel, between Instagram, um, trying to get the people to to come on and, and, and share more stories um, to the people to listen. So, yeah. Emma, thank you so much for your time, making the time for me. I do appreciate it. Um, and I value your time. Uh, we'll be in touch soon. So Emma's going to be coming on again in, in the month of July. So yes, thank you so much, Emma. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye. Take care. Ciao. Bye.